Before we begin in Acts chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 5 all the way down to uh, verse 31. Um, we are going to, I just want to take a look here real quick again at a man from church history. How many of you know the name William Tyndale? Good. Very good. That's great to hear. My wife just got me a new William Tyndale shirt for Father's Day that I've been wearing around. So I've been very happy about that. She got me a Jonathan Edwards coffee cup and a William Tyndale shirt. So she knew the way to my heart in those. But I wanted to tell you the story of William Tyndale because we continue to study what? Inspired church history. And so I like visiting these stories, these narratives in church history that parallel what we see in the book of Acts. So I want to tell you a little bit about William Tyndale. Does anyone know why William Tyndale is so significant? Why he's so important? Yes, Tim. Yeah, uh, in, in large part, that is very true. He actually, if you remember the setting he was in, was in the 1500s, right? And in the 1500s, you had the Roman Catholic Church, which basically had the ability to rule and reign over the distrib distributing of Scripture. 1400, just go back a couple hundred years or so before this, 150 years, you had a guy by the name of John Wycliffe. What did he do? He translated a version of the Scriptures that got circulated. After Wycliffe's done with his translation, what did the Roman Catholic Church start seeing? Lives were being transformed by the power of the Gospel because people had a copy of God's Word. Prior to that time, you had had roughly a thousand years, eleven hundred years of darkness where they only had translations of the Bible in Latin, and so people in the English tongue could not get access to it, nor could they in the German tongue. Hence, 1522, what's Luther do? He puts his first copy out to give people a copy of God's Word in German. William Tyndale is to the English Reformation and what you hold in your hand, what Luther was to Germany in that portion of the Reformation. In fact, he translated his first edition of the New Testament in 1526 from Worms, and then in his second edition in 1534. But here's the thing. At that time, it was heresy, punishable by death, if you put out copies of the Scripture. And so William Tyndale had himself a bit of a fight. Let me tell you about Tyndale a little bit. Tyndale was saved early in his life and immediately had a burden to get the Scriptures to the common man. Now, if you're wondering if you'll ever be a Tyndale, I can assure you you won't. Unless you are fluent in eight different languages and can handle the Greek and Hebrew like a scholar. Tyndale was a bit of a mutant when it came to his ability to handle the languages, which is why God uniquely used him as a translator, because even John Wycliffe's translation was coming from the Latin versions. Tyndale was going to the Greek and the Hebrew and extracting the meaning. And you want to know why he ticked off the Roman Catholic Church? When they would say things in their translation where the word repentance was, or where the word repentance should be, they would put penance. He translated it, repentance. <laughs> when they would talk about the church and they would say, we are the holy church, he would put congregation. He was trying to gather in a biblical ecclesiology and a biblical understanding that was offending them greatly. But here's what really burdened Tyndale. And this is a parallel for our day to day in so many so-called churches that muzzle and mute and filter truth. And it's a parallel for Acts chapter 4 is that there is always a opponent when the Word of God is going forth. Satan is always doing all he can to stop the Word of God in people, getting into people's minds with the utmost clarity, right? This is what Satan's always after. Because if people have access to the truth, what? They can be transformed. Faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing and hearing the Word of what? Christ. So, Tyndale was burdened about that. Let me just tell you a little bit about what Tyndale was up against. Here's what he said about the false church of Roman Catholicism. He says this, how the church distorts Scripture. But other rebels, rebels to the papal authority and biblical authority, got around the weight and authority of the Word and they made it ambiguous. They deliberately diluted it so people would not have access to it. That burdened Tyndale. Again, Tyndale says this, not only did they have control of the churches, but they had control of the universities. 
In the universities, the Roman Catholic Church has ordained that no man shall look at Scripture until he has been nursed or trained in heathen learning for eight or nine years and armed with false principles with which he is clean shut out of the understanding of Scripture. You realize that ever since the garden and what Satan did trying to distort the Scripture, there's always a movement to try and muzzle the truth in every generation, including what we're going to see in Acts today. Tyndale says this in response to them. Instead of concealing Scripture, hiding it, by locking it under the Latin language, we should unleash it. Just as it was taught by the apostles in the common tongue. I bet you when you see our narrative today in Acts 4, that Tyndale himself would have went back and read Acts 4 to, to regain and recalibrate the courage he needed to stand in his day. Because that's what Acts 4 is all about. Standing against men who want to keep people from truth. Here's another thing that Tyndale says to hear his heart. He says this, It's not enough to have it translated, though it were the whole Scripture, into the, vulgar and, uh, into the vulgar and common tongue, except we also bring again the light to understand it and expel the dark cloud which the hypocrites have spread over the face of Scripture to blind the right sense and the true meaning. Well, you can imagine that got Tyndale in a bit of trouble. <laughs> so he became a fugitive and for 12 years he was on the run very difficult time from country to country running and what was his goal how do I find a printing press how do I translate it how do I get the word of God out and the Roman Catholic Church is just chasing him down everywhere they can to try and do what suppress the truth stomp it out we don't want people getting the word of God and then he was betrayed by a Judas he befriended a man by the name of Henry Phillips. Henry Phillips came to be a man he trusted. Phillips told Tyndale one evening, I'd like to have you over for dinner. Henry Phillips has him over for a nice meal. They're chatting a bit in kind of the front entryway and then um, Henry Phillips must have, a, must have had a larger home. They walked down kind of a corridor that was gonna go into an open area where they would have their meal. And Henry Phillips, as the story goes, like a gentleman, opened the door for William Tyndale, the fugitive on the run, and as he walked out the door, he pointed at him and says, here he is, and the guards rushed him and grabbed him. Tyndale spent the next 500 days in prison. 500 days in prison. And yesterday, I read a letter that he wrote to the officials that were overseeing his stay in prison. And uh, hopefully I can get through it without crying today. But when I read it yesterday, it had me to tears, and I'll tell you why. Because... Because you see this man in prison, <laughs> captured for the gospel, just because he wanted men to know the scriptures. Here's what Tyndale wrote about his time in prison. And if you don't see a heart of a man that's absolutely being spent for the soul of others, even at the cost of his own life, you're, you're missing this. Here's what he said. Where I beg your lordship that if I remain here through the winter that you will request the commissionary to have the kindness to send me. Listen to what he wants. What would you want if you were in prison for five, 500 days? Here's what he wants. From the goods of mine, could you send me a warmer cap? For I suffer greatly from the cold in my head. And I am affected by a perpetual uh, catar, uh, catarha, uh, an infection, I think, which is much increased in this cell. A warmer coat also. For this which also that I, ha that I have is very thin. And a piece of cloth too to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out. My shirts are also worn out. He has a woolen shirt if he will be good enough to send it to me. I have also with him, his stuff, leggings of thicker cloth to put on above. And I have a warmer nightcap as well. And I ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. It is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark. But most of all, I beg and beseech your clemency to be urgent with this, commission, this, this letter that he will kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible and my Hebrew grammar and my Hebrew dictionary that I may pass the time in the study and in return you may obtain what you most desire so only that it be for the salvation of your soul. He's saying, I will give you truth so your soul can be saved. 
But if any other decision has been taken concerning me to be carried out before winter, I will be patient, abiding in the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ. I pray He may direct your heart. William Tyndale. He wanted to translate the Old Testament. He just wanted to get the Word of God to the common man. He wanted them to have access to their Old Testament. His charge was heresy because he did not agree with the Roman emperor and what he said about who should have access to the Word. And you know what, what Tyndale said back to them? I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a plowboy to know more of the Scripture than you do. <laughs> August 6th, 1536, outside of Brussels, William Tyndale was martyred. He was first tied to a stake, and his last words were this, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Even his last breath was, Lord, get the Scripture to people that don't know it so they can be saved. He was then strangled, and his body was consumed with fire. By the time the cord was loosened from his neck, his faith had become sight. He was 42 years old. I gathered a lot of that from our own John Anderson's work on Tyndale and his bi biographical work. You can listen to that on our website. Beloved, listen to me. The reason I wanted to share that story with you is when you hear a story like that, what does it do in your heart? How does it challenge you? Tell me, how does a man like that's life challenge you? That commitment to make the Scripture known to people that don't know it. What's that do in your heart? What's it do? Sobering. Sobering. It's convicting. Cameron. Lights and fire. I want to be that useful. I want to stand. I want to be like that. Do you know that Tyndale held the same conviction that the early church held? They were far more concerned about sinning than they were suffering. Namely, sinning by compromising when they should get people to truth by having fear of man. And that is exactly what is going on in Acts 4. You have a showdown between the authorities who want to muzzle the truth and Peter who's unwilling to have it muzzled and he stands. And just like William Tyndale, he would have looked back to Peter in Acts 4 and we look back to Tyndale and we look back to these men and we say, Lord, make me stand like this. How do I get this conviction? Well, how you do it is you look at inspired church history. And that's what we're going to see today. The inspired church history of a showdown for the Scripture being clearly known. So let's walk through it. We are going to look at a showdown over the truth being known. And beloved, when you read this and you see it, let it encourage you in this way. Every interaction you have in your life with someone that doesn't know Christ, there is a showdown. You want the Scripture to be made known, and they don't. Why? John 3 says, Men love the darkness, and they hate the light. So when the light comes, they want to stomp it out. This is the human heart's bent on the pages of Scripture. And the early church, beloved, would have needed to see this. Because, beloved, what you're about to see is Peter stand when the church was facing its first difficulty. Think about this. If Peter didn't stand here, what would that have meant for the rest of the church and the Tyndales of the world. And for us. But Peter stands. So let's look at it. We're going to look at five scenes on the showdown over the truth being known. And we're going to cover a lot of ground. And we're going to finish this narrative this morning because it is one big idea. A showdown for truth. Notice scene one. A mock trial is used as a decoy to conceal the truth. A mock trial is used as a decoy to conceal the truth. Notice the opponents here. Verse 5, On the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all of the high priestly descent. I'm in verses 5, 6, and 7 of chapter 4. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or what name have you done this? If you weren't here last week, you're probably going, what is going on in this scene? Well, look back at chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. As the people were speaking, the priests and the captain, the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to them. Who was speaking? Peter had just preached this blistering sermon. God had just saved 5,000 plus people. 
And the authorities were not happy with that. So notice what happened. They came up, being greatly disturbed, verse 2, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection. They laid hands on them, put them in jail, until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men was 5,000. So it was more than that. That was just the men. Then on the next day, that's where we're at. Where are we at? We're at the next day where there's a court hearing. It's a mock trial though. But this is not a small trial. Look at all the parties that are in attendance. Notice, just look back there at verses 5 and 6. You've got rulers and chief priests. That's, the, that's 24 elders of the priestly order. Okay, You've got the elders, the family heads. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got Annas there. He was the previous high priest, a scholar in the scripture. Um, you say, why do they call him the high priest? It's like a president. Even though they become the ex-president, you still call him president so-and-so. That's like the high priest. And then his son-in-law is there. Look, Caiaphas. He's the current high priest, a keeper of the law. And you've got John and Alexander. We don't know a lot about them, but their names would have had a, a, a polarizing effect because all Luke had to do was state them and the early church knew. If you count that up, beloved, you've got Peter and John and the man that we'll see in a moment who was healed. There sitting before, if you count that up, at least 42 men. So imagine, if you look there, it says there, they put them, look back at the text, they put them, they placed them in the center and began to inquire. Verse 7, look at it. They placed them in the center and they began to inquire. So here's what I want you to imagine. Here's how they'd do this. They'd have all the men of these, these highest level authorities. These are the best, these are the best attorneys of the day. These are the best judges of the day. These are the law keepers. And they'd put them in a half circle. So imagine a half circle going like this. And it'd be in part of the temple. It was this area where the, the, um, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, all that made them up, they would meet to oversee on, on behalf of Rome these cases. And they'd put them in a half circle and then they'd put the men in the middle to intimidate them and to inquire about whether they were innocent or not. And how they would do it is all the men would come in and formally sit down and then they'd bring in the prisoners or those that were guilty and they'd put them before them and they'd start grilling them with questions. So this is not a, a small event. And what's interesting is they didn't necessarily have to have all the big guns in town. You didn't always have to do that. But everyone's here. Old high priest, current high priest, <laughs> all these tribal leaders, the chief priests, these other men. Everyone is coming for this event. This is a very intense and formal process. You think, how intense would that be? Just imagine if, let's say, how concerned the other church would be. Let's say that uh, Pastor Jerry and Pastor Todd <laughs> were ripped out of our church for preaching the gospel, taken and put on national television, and they brought all nine judges, they brought the president, <laughs> they brought an old president, they brought the best attorneys in the country and they surrounded around them and they put them in the middle of them and they were going to interrogate them based on their beliefs. It would be a significant event. You can imagine the early church just wondering, thinking, praying. Okay, Jesus just said that He will build His church. He's just left. He sent us these apostles. They've been doing these great miracles. Are we... Lord, what is going to happen are we going to lose two of them? Are they going to compromise? Are they going to stand? What, what would go down? This was a significant event. But look at how I said this is a decoy. They were hiding their real motives. Notice the question they ask in verse 7. By what power or what name have you done this? Translation, by what authority have you done this miracle? Remember, they healed the man who was a 40-year cripple and made it so he can walk in the last section. So they're saying to him, by what authority have you done this miracle? Now, you may say, okay, hold on a second. Why are they in trouble for doing a miracle? Why would it be legitimate for the chief priests and the Sanhedrin to bring them in? Well, according to Deuteronomy 13, 1-5, if a miracle had been done, there was place for the scribal order to bring someone in and evaluate whether the miracle was legitimate and if the miracle was potentially something that, if you go read Deuteronomy 13, where they did the miracle so they could preach a different truth and get people away from the one true God. So they would take it, take, kind of pull them in and investigate them. But this is so convenient for them. You understand, they're not really concerned about the miracle. If they did this for every miracle, they would have had Jesus in here all the time. 
They were, they were conveniently applying the truth in a way that was comfortable for them because they didn't like that it happened. In fact, this has nothing to do with the miracle. Why? What were they arrested for? A miracle or preaching? Look back. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4. These men, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these religious leaders, they were greatly disturbed. Verse 2. What's the word for disturbed? Angry. Hostile. They were upset in their conscience. They wanted to shut up and silence the people that were speaking. Why? Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection. So they laid hands on them and put them in jail. This isn't about a miracle. This is about their preaching. What is going on? They're trying to make it seem like, oh, we're really concerned about your miracle. What are they really trying to do? We want to shut you up from preaching about the Messiah. We don't want people to know that the Word of God and what it says. We don't want to know the Old Testament promises about Him and we don't want you saying that He's risen from the grave. Why? What did this same group do eight weeks ago? Eight weeks before this, they successfully had... Peter and John's leader executed that guy named Jesus from Nazareth. Now, I just want you to back up. Think about the scene here in the context. Jerusalem has about 200,000 people in it at the time. Okay, just think about this. Eight weeks ago, they killed this guy that said he was the Messiah because he wouldn't stop giving his message. So they killed him for his message. And they made it seem like it was other things, but they just wanted to kill him. They wanted him dead. They wanted him shut up. And then there's a whole bunch of people that see this Jesus and there's an empty tomb. So that's got this group panicked. And then these disciples that he's commissioned go out and they start preaching and 3,000 plus people are saved after Peter's first sermon. Jerusalem would have heard all about that. They'd have been buzzing. Think about it. People that worked in the market that were once angry and hostile are now kind and humble. Families would start getting divided. A husband would come to Christ and a wife wouldn't or vice versa. People in the public square and people in the higher levels of society would have been saved and started preaching the truth. There would have been a lot of nervousness going on around Jerusalem. And then just yesterday, Peter preaches and 5,000 more plus people are born again. You've got 8,000 plus people running around Jerusalem to some degree telling about their newfound Messiah. And then the baptisms. Wow, 8,000 plus baptisms in the pools around Jerusalem? Are you kidding? Everywhere they'd look, they'd be seeing Christians give public testimony. These men were nervous. This was a showdown. They were trying to silence and muzzle the truth. This is not a small event. If they could just get Peter to compromise and capitulate, they could undo everything and they could justify the fact that they were right in having the Messiah, so-called Messiah, executed. For the early church, this would have been one of the most important stories for them to study, to see how men stood in the face of adversity. In our day, this would be viral, number one on YouTube. (laughs) So that's the mock trial. It's a decoy. They just want to silence the truth. They're trying to make about the miracle. They don't care about the miracle. They want to shut Peter up. And they'll say that in a little bit. Scene two. Peter won't allow their mock trial to silence the truth. Beloved, Peter won't allow them to silence the truth. What an encouragement. Verse eight. Then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit. That does not mean he was totally passive in that. He was yielded to the Spirit. But this is the, the filling that comes for a special work that God has him to do. And here's what Peter says to them. Rulers and elders of the people. Now just imagine the scene. <laughs> slot in your favorite pastor. The one you look up to. Whatever. Slot him in. And think about him standing before at least 42. Who could go like this if they wanted to. And find a way to take his life. Okay? He's respectful. Rulers and elders. He abides by the law of the land. I'll acknowledge your place in society. God's placed you there. I'll acknowledge it. Look at it. Rulers, authorities, elders. Okay. But I got some words for you. You want to make this about the miracle? We know this was what this is really about. Verse 9. If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, He says, okay guys, you want to make it about the healing? You want to make it about the man? Even though you arrested me yesterday for preaching? Okay, that's fine. Verse 10. Let this be known to you all. He changes to an imperative voice in the Greek text. Listen up, men. (laughs) 
Let it be known to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene... Now, immediately, when he brings up Jesus Christ the Nazarene, his human name, the man that they executed, probably a few of them would have gasped. Oh, this guy's talking about Jesus again. I wish they'd shut up about him. But he doesn't stop there. Can you imagine his next words? Yeah, that Jesus Christ the Nazarene, look at verse 10. By the way, whom you crucified. <laughs> 42 men of the highest dignity and highest authority, at least 42 men, sitting there, and they were just told by this ex-fisherman, you guys are a bunch of murderers. <laughs> That's basically the equivalent of the sitting president the ex-president, nine Supreme Court judges, the top lawyers in the land, and someone going before them and saying, yeah, you guys are a whole bunch of murderers. What he says next is amazing. You may have killed him, keep looking at the verse, but God raised him from the dead. The guy you claim to worship. Whom God raised from the dead. You ask me what authority I healed him? I'll tell you what authority I healed him. The God of the Old Testament and Jesus himself. That's the authority. You want to know the authority? You think you're an authority? You're no authority. You killed him, God raised him. You think he took death in the grave, he walked right out with death. Look at this. By that power, this man, Jesus, he's the one that makes this guy standing next to us in good health. And they couldn't deny it. The guy just yesterday was doing jumping jacks in the temple after he'd been crippled for 40 years. There was no denying it. And then he does the unthinkable. You think Peter hasn't offended him enough? Now he quotes the Old Testament to them and inserts their name as the ones that were rejecting the Messiah. Notice, verse 11. He, Jesus, the stone which was rejected. And then he adds something. That's Psalm 118.22. He adds a little comment to them. The stone that was rejected, verse 11, by you. <laughs> Man. They know their Old Testament. These are the keepers of the law, guys. They know the Word of God. The moment he quotes it, most of them would have known the text he was in. He said, oh yeah, that text that talked about people rejecting the Messiah, let me just go ahead and apply that to you and you and you and you and you and you and you. He, the one that was rejected by the builders, has become the chief cornerstone. That is the, the, the side stone that upholds everything else. It's the cornerstone of a building. That was Jesus. He upholds everything. And then Peter says this to them. Peter preaches the gospel to them. You know why Peter didn't grumble and get upset when he was arrested the day before? He wanted to preach the gospel. Perfect. Arrest me? Awesome. I can get the gospel to the Sanhedrin. Come on. Let's go. Take me to prison. I get before the Sanhedrin. Perfect. Look what he says. Verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no name under heaven that has been given among men that by which we must be saved. Translation, God in heaven declared Him so, and you should repent. Now, you read that. Wouldn't you hope the Sanhedrin would be like, okay, that's it. We're done. We're dead. We're busted again. We've been exposed. This isn't good. But just like people in your life, when you start preaching truth to them, you give people the Word of God, you're thinking, I couldn't wax more eloquent on the gospel. I couldn't have been more clear to you. And instead of them softening, they harden. Instead of them embracing it, they push back. And what happens? They start to dance. Right? When we share the gospel with people and they don't like the truth, they dance. They blame us. They attack us. They try and change the topic. They change the issue. They just don't want to deal with one thing. My conscience is bearing down on me. I know that to be true, but I hate it because I love myself. You've got to realize, every unbeliever you talk to hates the truth. They want to suppress it. It's in their heart. And so these Sanhedrin, the top teachers of the law in the day, become like a bunch of juvenile little kids trying to figure out how to manipulate their way out of trouble on the playground. You want to see what human depravity looks like? Look at scene 3, verse 13. The Sanhedrin rally again to try and silence the Scripture. And this would have been comforting for the early church. Because we're about to see here, even when Peter's preaching, beloved, if God's not softening the heart and men won't soften, they're going to do everything they can to get out from under that burden of the truth. And these men, these top teachers of the day, they just demonstrate their depravity. Notice, 
They try and silence the scriptures. The showdown continues. Verse 13. Now, as they, uh, now watch this. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. Translation, what in the world are these fishermen doing standing in front of me talking to me like they're an authority? I'm the authority. You're a fisherman. Why are you speaking like this to me? But look what it says. They were amazed and began to recognize that these men had been with Jesus. Now, I read that again this morning and I thought, man, I want people to say when they meet me, that guy knows Jesus. He's spent time with Jesus. He's hung out with Jesus. Jesus is not just his homeboy. Jesus is his Lord. He's also his friend. He's his master. And when I get around him, it reflects to me that he is like Jesus. And do you know why they're crediting these fishermen acting like Jesus? Because what did it say about Jesus? He spoke with one who had authority. No one had ever gone to the law teachers of the day and engaged them with conviction. These men are watching two fishermen not care about their lives, be more concerned about sinning and compromising than suffering. Those men knew that they could put their thumb down and take their life. And so when they saw these guys have the same problem that Jesus did, no matter how much we tried to shut him up, he wouldn't be quiet. We even had to kill him to shut him up, and now he's just spreading. Now he's got followers doing the same thing. Wow. They were amazed. The idea of shock. These guys have the same thing that Jesus had. A courage and conviction that transcends any fear of man. They just love the truth and they want it known and no matter what we're going to do, we're not going to stop them today. Untrained and uneducated. They're supposed to be spellbound by these men. They're not. The top investigators of the day can't make a man of conviction not speak. Why so bold? Why so fearless? They know Jesus. Look at verse 14. And seeing that the man who had been healed was standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. They can't go against the miracle. They can't go against the message. What are they going to do? Can you imagine 42 of the top attorneys of the day who are paid and have their life's goal to be able to speak and investigate? Mouth shut. Only Jesus could do that. Verse 15. You could put, it says but, but it's not really a contrast. It's just progression. And, verse 15, and when they had ordered them to leave, so what do they do? We can't talk. You guys get out of here. we got to regroup. <laughs> they began to confer with one another. Can you imagine? Here are the best law keepers of the day that are spellbound and don't know what to do. So what do they say? Verse 16, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that, that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Before you think this is about the miracle, look at verse 17. The miracle points to the message. But, so that it will not spread any further among the people, what won't spread? Their message. Let us warn them not to speak. Let, Let us warn them to speak no longer, verse 17, to any man in his name. Don't talk about Jesus, we're going to tell them. Verse 18, And when they summoned them in, they commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. This isn't about the miracle. Now they're done doing the miracle charade. They're done trying to make it about the miracle. Now we're just going to tell you, stop talking about Jesus. We're going to muzzle the truth. Showdown again. Here's Peter. They come back. I wonder if Peter and John were praying, singing, saying, okay. When they come back, after they deliberate, what's going to happen? So they come back and they say, Peter, John, you guys need to stop talking about Jesus the Messiah. (laughs) Oh, look at what Peter says in this showdown here. Showdown continues. Look at what Peter says, verse 19. But Peter and John answered them. Now both men are speaking with conviction. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. Translation? Let me ask you men something. Who's a higher court, you or God? Do I bow to the king of the universe or am I going to come and bow to your little puny court? You men think you're an authority? You think you're something important? I bow to the king of the universe. And he says that I obey God rather than men if men try and get me to go against the scriptures. We'll see that in the next chapter. Look at that. 
Who holds the higher court, men? You or God? And then he says, I, I figured he would say, let me tell you. But he just says, you be the judge. You know the Old Testament. You know what it says. Who's the higher court? God or you? I mean, <laughs> could you imagine these guys? They just must be like, we are not budging these dudes. They are not moving. I don't think they said dudes. We are not <laughs> budging these men. Why can't they stop speaking? Verse 20. For we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. We are men of conviction. Now here's what's amazing. The showdown has come to its final end. But again, the early church would have seen three responses to what just happened. Three responses show up at the end of the showdown. First, notice verse 21, the religious leader's response. When they threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis to punish them. Why no basis to punish them? Because of the people who were glorifying God for what had happened. Don't miss that. Luke gives a commentary. You know what was wrong with the religious leaders? They were so obsessed with their reputation. They were so obsessed with the people thinking much of them that because the people were buying into it a little bit, they said, okay, we can't do anything to them. We don't want to lose influence. Now think about the irony of that. They should have heard the message from Peter, feared God, repented, and fall down in dust and ashes. But instead, they were so obsessed with their reputation and they loved men's approval to such a degree that they were even willing to muzzle what Peter said and not do anything that could cost them, like executing them. Instead, they just warned them and said, Ooh, what are the people? Okay, people don't want us to do it right now? Okay, you guys can go, but don't do it again. Like a school teacher. I know you weren't really supposed to be in trouble, but don't you do what you didn't do again. <laughs> It's nonsense. Why? They loved the approval of man. Look at it again. Verse 21. On the account of the people, they would not speak. So there's your first response. The religious leaders, lust for man's approval, shielded them from repentance. Second response. The people. Notice. The people were doing what? Glorifying God for what had happened. Now, I don't think that's salvation. Because they're not glorifying God because of Christ being preached. Notice what they're glorifying God for. Verse 22. For the man, here's the grammatical reason. The reason they were glorifying is not Jesus in the message, but for the man who was more than 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. The reason this crowd was responding is they were amazed by miracles. So now you've got another response. You've got this hard-hearted response. Then you've got this, whoa, this is really exciting. We're praising this God. Maybe we believe and maybe we don't because of this miracle we've seen. And when you see that word praise, it's also used in Luke 4.15, glorified. When Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, all were praising Him, but they weren't saved. It's an amazement. It can also be used for salvation, but here it's just amazement. So you've got the second audience. Maybe you feel like that sometimes. You go preach the gospel to someone, you tell them the truth, you stand, and some, I hate you, don't talk to me, you're in a cult, <laughs> Don't talk to me about that message anymore. It makes me feel convicted. I feel uncomfortable. You're making me feel bad. My self-esteem hurts. Whatever. And you got another group that's like, whoa, amazing, awesome, cool. I like to see the power of things going on, but I'm not sure I want to give up my heart to him. Maybe I'll listen for another day. But then there's the response of the church and the apostles. The third response to the showdown. Look at verse 23. But now the apostles and the believers, when they had been released... They went to their own companions. That's language for their sphere of influence. Those that would have wanted to know. And they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Stop there. What did these believers do after they had been in this showdown? They went back to their buddies and said, You wouldn't believe what God has done. People might have said, Did God save the chief priests and the elders? No. But we got to proclaim Christ before the highest court. Wow, that's amazing. And what happened? Uh, they almost killed us, but they decided not to. By the grace of God, we were mercifully spared. They let us go. You should have heard what Peter said to him. It was incredible. And then John spoke up, and all we did was just stand for the truth. We gave our lives to Christ. We didn't want to compromise. And they let us go. They just told us don't do it again. And if we do it again, we may be back there again. So be aware. But then notice what happened. They broke out in worship. When they heard this, verse 24, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Beloved, 
Stop there. What did the early church do when they had a showdown for authority that was difficult, that was hard, they stood for the truth and someone rejected it? What did they do? They went back to the body of Christ. They found other believers. They encouraged one another. They sang together. They prayed together. They were ministered to together. Sometimes we have a difficult interaction with someone in our family and we go, oh, it's so hard. It's so difficult. They don't like me. Oh, man. And they're going, what a privilege that we are not liked for the sake of Christ. Wow. Guys, let's praise God. We pray and claim the gospel and they treat us like they treated Jesus. Hallelujah. You realize that persecution strengthens the church because people come together when there's a trial and stand with one another. This is why persecution is so purifying. The more hostility the church faces, the more they gather together in unity. The less hostility, the more petty the church is. This is probably why so many churches today that don't preach hard truth have such poor unity. Because they're not getting pushed back from by the culture so they don't gather together to come together and be unified. They're too busy courting the culture and trying to get everyone to like them. Like I would imagine if a whole bunch of churches today started standing with Acts 4 convictions, the culture would hate the church of Jesus Christ a lot more than it does. But since the church today is trying to entertain the world and make Sunday morning a little bit more doctrinal than Saturday night, but equally as entertaining, you face no reproach. Oh, they're not that bad. They say some hard things, but they're, they're, they really don't say things that are going to cost me. This church, they didn't care. What burdened their conscience was the truth. Guys, we need to stand like this. Notice what happens. Verse 25. 24. They heard this. They lifted their voices in one accord. And they sang. And Psalm 146.6. They prayed, sang, and said, O Lord... I'm in verse 24. It is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. And then they quote Psalm 2, 1 to 2. Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father, David, your servant, said this. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Reason? That happened? That rulers, those authorities, they know what's going on. Verse 27, For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. And then look at this. They they document, they know why this is going on because they are godly believers. They realize that men are always going to oppose Christ. When the truth's being known, Satan's going to spin as many people out there to try and smash it. But then they acknowledge that God's always on the throne. Verse 28, God... You do whatever it is with your hand and your purpose that's predestined to occur. Then 29. And now, Lord, look at this. Now they pray. Now look at this prayer request. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. And what would our prayer be? Dot, dot, dot. And Lord, please help me not have any more difficult interactions with my family. (laughs) Lord, and please make it so it's not so difficult on my campus. And Lord, please make it so it's not so hard in that one friendship because it's just been so difficult every time I've talked to them about truth. That's not what they prayed. Here's what they prayed. Lord, would you please take note of their threats? Verse 29 and grant that your slaves may speak the word of God with confidence next time. You know what their prayer was? Lord, give us another opportunity to preach. No matter the human response, we just want the opportunity to preach your name. Not compromise, not capitulate. We don't want to be like their fear of man. We just want to be useful to you. When the truth's being stomped out, just give us another opportunity to proclaim. And then, he shows the purpose of the miracles was for the message. At the same time as they're concerned about being able to preach, verse 30, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders and take place through the name of your Holy Servant, Jesus. Give us more opportunities to preach the more you allow us to do these miracles. And when they had prayed, the place that they had gathered was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, a special anointing of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. It is not to say that the same thing is not for us today to see these types of narratives. And look at it again. Speak with boldness. What's the implication, beloved? Turn to John 3. Let me show you the implication of all this. Let's just pull all this in and end with this. What's the implication? If you are a Christian... You should be very, very, very thoughtful that people don't treat you better than they treated Christ. (laughs) 
If people treat you that are unbelievers better than they treated Christ and better than they treated an apostles, it's not a sign that you're like Christ. It's a sign you're too much like the world. He was perfect, he never sinned, and they killed him. And we just need to remember, beloved, when you leave here and you go into your sphere of influence, we love John 3.16. Who doesn't love that God so loved the world? But if you read on in the context, it gets pretty dicey when you start preaching this message. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son, and whoever believes in Him shall perish but have eternal life. I heard that message my whole life. Verse 17, For God did not send the Son of the world to judge the world, but that the world would be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe Him is judged already. I didn't hear that message a lot. Because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Here it is. This is the judgment. That the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. And does not come to the light. For fear, look at it, that their deeds will be exposed. Beloved, just realize you are in the ministry of preaching the light that exposed darkness and deeds. For people to be saved, they have to see their darkness. But men hate it when you preach the light and they're not softening their heart in repentance. So we can't imagine that we're going to keep all these platonic, nice, comfortable relationships if we're going to be faithful messengers. Jerry preached on this last week, right? We align ourselves with God's purposes. When we bring the truth, are we winsome? Of course. Are we gracious? Of course. Are we kind? Of course. Do we serve everywhere we can? Of course. But don't bend what God has made straight. Don't, don't blunt what He's made sharp. The early church would have looked to Peter and John and said, okay, there's the model. We stand on the truth. We leave the rest of the outcome to God. We're more concerned about sinning in fear of man than suffering from the outcome. We'll stand. We'll just see more and more in that in the weeks ahead. Last, question, last thing, implication that hit me was this. Thank you, Lord, that I go to a church, that I was brought up in a church that doesn't muzzle, doesn't mute, doesn't filter, doesn't compromise, doesn't capitulate, doesn't tell stories over the top of verses, doesn't focus on themselves. They just bring the clarity and let the Word of God shed His light on dark hearts. And everyone in this room that's saved is a recipient of a light-shedding ministry to dark hearts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, make us like Peter and John. Bold. Forgive us for uh, just our tendency to be like the religious leaders that are so committed to what others will think of us that we sometimes even dull an edge that you've made sharp. Lord, we don't want to be ungracious. We don't want to lack a winsomeness. But Lord, please help us from never putting a filter on what you have made clear. And as we look at William Tyndale and his willingness to stand, as we look at Peter and John in the coming chapters, as we look at Stephen, as we look at Paul, Lord, inspired church history is meant by you, God, to inspire us to stand. Lord, please help us. Give us the grace and mercy as we obey Ephesians 5 and walk in the Spirit. And we be filled up with the Spirit as we submit our lives to truth. And we be the type of people that shine light. And when we think of Ephesians 5, that when we shine the light on darkness, you call men to be saved. Help us not to be so in love with ourselves, Lord, that we keep people from the very thing that could save them. And thank you for inspired church history. We need narratives like this more often than we probably like to admit because we are a people that lack courage.